The topic for today's webinar is Are you in control of tax and transfer pricing? Our presenters for today's webinar are Maria, who is an associate with uh, TPA Global, and the other presenter is Mr. Raymond, who is a CFO at TPA Global. Maria has expertise in financial services and the automobile sector, whereas Raymond has expertise in a number of industries, more specifically chemical, financial services, pharmaceutical, and the health sector. Thank you, Anusha. Uh, so as you uh, have heard, our today's webinar is about being in control. And we're going to start with setting the scene. So today's world has completely changed with BAPS rules, and we can call it brave new world, because before 2015, before BAPS was introduced, uh, what tax inspector was getting uh, in the end of financial year was maybe a local TP documentation, certainly a corporate tax return. And uh, the information was relatively limited, and uh, only if the inspector would start an audit, he would get something more, but it will get, uh, it will require time, it will require effort, and also tax, tax inspectors should have sufficient grounds to start an audit. So that was relatively easy to avoid any issues and any challenges. Nowadays, a uh, tax inspector in the end of financial year would receive much more information, which is also really sensitive. Uh, as you know, According to BAPS OECD, it is now required to submit country-by-country -country report for big multinationals and for almost all multinationals, master file, local file, and of course, corporate tax return. These four components combined together give a really comprehensive picture to tax inspector. In particular, uh, through looking into C by C, tax inspector may see uh, level of full-time employees against the level of EBIT allocated within the multinational. For example, uh, if we look at the typical manufacturing company in China, which has, let's say, 2,000 employees, and the EBIT allocated to that company is 2%, while the head of the company is in Zurich with, let's say, five employees, but 13% of EBIT allocated to the company. So if Chinese tax inspector look at, looks at such picture, he will definitely raise more questions than previously, looking into just local Chinese files. So with this thing available, I don't think many uh, tax and TP functions can now claim they're in control, because here and there, we of course know there are some issues. Uh, but now these issues are going to be on the surface and will be visible to tax inspectors all around the world. So, how to manage in this brave new world? Uh, we suggest that uh, you should first start with uh, organizational aspects, which is actually organizing your gov uh, tax and TP function, organizing the governance with the function, spreading the functions among people, and looking who should be responsible for what in order to make it efficient. Second, it is necessary to look at operational parts, which is uh, compliance, uh, as I already mentioned, C by C, master file, local file, and uh, form. Uh, and second is to look it into your risks and opportunities. So before that, uh, tax was more about the planning. Now it's actually to manage uh, not only to plan, so to decrease your ETR, but also to manage uh, risks, which means your ETR increasing due to uh, different circumstances. Last but not least is to look into technical side, which is uh, to look at specific challenges raised by BAPS and by changed rules. Uh, as for example, permanent establishment rules or uh, uh, action 8 to 10 rules. Simon, thank you for good. Thank you, Maria. Thanks, Maria. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I think that uh, a number of you that are listening um, 
you know, you will know what it means to run a tax function or a transfer pricing function within the tax function because that's what you've been doing already quite a while. So that is not necessarily new. What I think we're trying to say here is that even more so in the post BEPS world, um, getting your governance in shape and having a tight control around it will become much more important. Uh, so in sense, in that sense, I just wanted to, maybe for some of you, um, it's repetition for others. Uh, it might be something which uh, you may want to have a look at. But, you know, are you in control means that you have a good governance model. It means that you also have um, a very good tax control framework in place uh, and a TP control framework. And then you have what we call the realities, which is this actual life. That's an area where you will no doubt realize that uh, BAPS is targeting that those realities are also reflected effectively into your model that you chose uh, as an operating model for tax purposes. But if we stick to um, the governance model for a minute and the tax control framework, um, you know, there is a lot of uh, things happening uh, due to BAPS in the area of compliance. As uh, Marie already indicated, there is a lot of documents that need to be produced and it will be essential for the tax function to have a oversight on the content of those documents. And for that, you need to make sure that you can tighten your grip as a tax function on what is effectively being shared with tax authorities. We'll get back to that in more detail. but. As a result, it is very relevant for you to go back to your drawing board on how you are organized today. Who is accountable? Who are your stakeholders that you deal with? How do you deal with risk management? And how do you communicate? Because you know your corporate income tax return, your CBC, a country by country, as well as your master file, local file, um, they will have to reflect information that hopefully is all pointing in the same direction. If we switch to quickly to the next slide, Maria, um, you know, we're talking again about setting up a global uh, tax and transfer pricing governance model in terms of who are the people involved, who has what responsibility, uh, how do we allocate roles uh, to, in, to these individuals, um, and it doesn't have to be the tax function only, it has to also include your business management, your operations, because a lot of information might stem from those organizations that are not under your direct um, control in the sense of that you have them into your organizational chart and that you have a hierarchy that, that you are in charge of these people. They are maybe your peers or people in other uh, jurisdictions, but they are important for you to provide information. Uh, a good example is always a corporate income tax return who produces that very often it's the local finance organization or the controller or a clerk at the local level that produces that document. But more and more that becomes important because you as a tax function want to understand what is being shared with the tax inspector and how does it line up with your CBC, which might be produced by your finance organization at a more central level. Uh, but still, these are people that are outside of your direct control but they are quite critical in terms of what the information is that they produce and you want to align it. Your transfer pricing function, you might already have a fully centralized or quasi centralized process in place which you do control and have access to in terms of the content that you can uh, deliver. So this is just a first indication and again we'll come back to that uh, at the latter part of the, um, uh, of the presentation for today. Uh, but it is critical that you find a good model where you assign people uh, to, to run the activity, but where you have an insight in what is being produced and even better, where you should even, and that would be my recommendation, there's different models obviously in place, but where you even have control over whether the content is accepted by you and if it's not, then you can stop the, uh, the filing until such time that you feel the content is correctly reflecting uh, what you think it should reflect from an operating point of view and from a tax operating point of view. Maria, if we move to the next slide, you can go a little bit more into detail of how such a, a model or what are the components of such a model for governing uh, 
uh, uh, should be considered. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, so this slide presents the example uh, how the TP governance can be organized. In particular, WinTPA believes that these are the components of a uh, successful uh, TP function. And uh, this, each of these components uh, has subcomponents, as we can say. So for example, for risk management, it is required to have a counter risk matrix uh, to do some tax provision work and to do BAPS readiness check. Uh, and uh, this, each function, then can be uh, presented in the organization in the form of uh, RACI matrix. RACI is a management concept which uh, implies having people uh, responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed about uh, various process, processes in the organization. Uh, and this table uh, suggests how the responsibilities can be allocated among uh, people in the function. Uh, for example, head of tax, out of TP uh, or legal team. Uh, if you look at this table, for example, uh, you may suggest that uh, head of tax should be responsible for uh, risk management, while a head of TP should be for sure responsible for global benchmarking platform and sign off on TP documents. Uh, this is only the example how the functions could be allocated. But uh, our suggestion is, uh, of course, uh, to make only one person responsible for each of the processes. Otherwise, uh, you may have uh, uh, some issues with responsibility or accountability, especially in the cases of tax audits, uh, or if it concerns something more important as criminal cases. Simon, do you have anything to add on this point? Well, actually, I think here is um, usually the heart of what happens on a day-to-day -day basis for, for anybody in, in the tax function. And as you can see, for instance, we have local finance team or, as Maria mentioned, the legal team or the business team. Um, it is very, very relevant that there is one person who has sign-off rights. And again, as I mentioned before, sign-off rights or the responsibility right um, out of own experience of running a global tax department in a multinational, I've always tried uh, to, to have an R uh, in my department with one of my people or with myself. Uh, in other words, be at the end of the line in the process and having the opportunity to either sign off or reject until such time that you feel that you get the right document uh, in your hands or the right answer to the question that you were raising. The accountability, which is the person that is effectively, um, sorry, the person who's, who's doing the job, who's actually physically performing the task, that could be a combination of more than just one person. And there you're going to be looking at what is my resource in the tax function. Uh, and we all know that staff and having FTEs, it's not easy to get your hands on. Um, so you should try to leverage from the availability of people in other functions like finance or legal or operations to help in providing information, writing up uh, descriptions of the business if you talk about a transfer pricing document um, that is obviously very helpful to understand how the business runs. Uh, in today's world uh, that is even more so the case because you have to start describing the value chain as such, uh, you have to describe the significant people functions. Well, who knows better than the business typically? And in today's world, writing it up in the way that we tax people feel it should be may not necessarily be the way forward anymore, but it needs to be reflecting effectively what is happening. So also here, uh, it can be very critical, and I would advise um, you know, people nowadays to really reach out to the business and for the business to be an integral part of your process of writing up a document so that you have real good factual content in there. Um, because if you think about it, what could be the counterweight of a tax authority? You know, you know better how your business runs than they do, so they will have a big challenge if your description is done very well and accurately and re represents reality, then you know tax inspectors will 
also in the future have a tough job challenging that. They can still negotiate with you, they still can you know, take you to the um, horse trading uh, exercises some have had experiences with, but still at least from a, uh, from a factual basis this is probably the best you can get your hands on. Um, Maria, do you want to add more points or are you fine with this? Yeah, I think I'm fine. Okay, then we move into the next slide and this is where I feel it becomes a bit interesting. As I said before, having run a global tax department myself for many years, I was always able in the before BAPS period to look at the tax function and be able internally to sell it, if you will, and I, I use the word sell in inverted commas, as a profit center. And the reason for that is relatively straightforward. In those days, and maybe until you know BAPS came in, planning was more at the forefront of what a tax department was at least anticipated and expected to, um, to, to be engaged in, aside from compliance, which also needed to be done because you needed to meet all legal requirements of filing tax returns, transfer pricing documents on time, etc. But the primary focus was on, you know, maybe doing effective tax rate management, which also means planning or probably meant more planning than anything else. Um, so if you take then the perspective of the CFO, and I've tried to reflect this here a little bit with the balance, in, in those days the CFO was looking at tax departments and saying, okay, what does planning bring me? Okay, there is a couple of dollars in the, in the balance uh, on the left-hand side, whereas the compliance costs were relatively light compared to you know, the benefits you could generate through proper planning. Um, so in effect, it's a very simple business concept of you know, the, 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 the benefits versus the cost. And if the net is a good, nice margin, you have a business case. And you could arguably state that you're a profit center as a tax department. And that's how you could get resources. That's how you could get your planning ideas, implemented restructurings, um, transfer pricing models, etc. BEPS has put a little bit of a, a dent in that opportunity and effectively is, is almost turning it upside down. So if you look at the other side where we say, you know, what is BEPS actually putting on us? It's putting a lot of compliance requirements on us. As I mentioned earlier, we now need to produce country by country for those of you that, that over, you know, go over to the, sorry, have a, have a higher revenue than the threshold that was given to us, by about 750 million euros. Um, in that CBC, there's a hell of a lot of detail, and that will be available to any tax inspector in the world. So we need to be carefully looking at this in the sense that we have a constant, uh, consistent base for information there, but that we also know what goes in there. So that's the first piece of compliance. The other piece of compliance that will come up is obviously around uh, transfer pricing documentation, which is not necessarily new, but has a couple of tweaks to it. One is that you have to come up with the value chain uh, analysis, as we've all uh, heard. We need to look at in, in, intangible assets, the DEMP functions. We need to look at uh, financing structures. We need to describe how we finance our group. Um, so again, there is a, a more holistic picture of what your organization looks like available to any tax inspector. That's quite new in that sense. So in, in this way they can look at, okay, where does the company that I need to assess as a tax inspector, where does it sit in the value chain? What kind of charges does it get from group companies? And by the way, those charges, those intercompany transactions are going to be reflected obviously in the local file. That's nothing new. But you now also have to reflect the other side of that transaction. So instead of a one-sided approach, which is the local entity, you also have to disclose the party that that company is transacting with. And maybe even you have to start weighing, you know, what is one party doing versus the other and is it still appropriate and at arm's length that your local entity is getting the margin it actually is getting. Uh, taking uh, Maria's example of earlier, 
if I have China with a couple of thousand people doing manufacturing and I've got a couple of people in Switzerland only, like you know, five people, uh, but they get 13% of a 15% EBIT, whereas China gets 2%, what does that mean? I could imagine that a tax expector in China or if the manufacturing would be sitting in Germany, it would be the same discussion, that at least they would be looking at this information and saying, why do they get 13 and I get only 2? It is a first step for this inspector to, at the minimum, put his pen to paper and, and, and ask you the question. And if you don't answer the question in the correct way, you know what it means. There is a next step and a next step, and before you know it, you got an audit. So in essence, compliance is now pushing you into a corner that you have to really manage your compliance and the content on the compliance side much better than you ever had to do before. And on top of it, the inspector has much more insight and transparency on what you do and how you do it, which leads much quicker to uh, you know, a, an audit process. But what is more, and that's probably what some, some of you might already be experiencing, and we at TPA Global, we're seeing it happening, is that tax planning is not that sexy anymore. Companies are looking at tax, trying to you know, save their reputation, maybe, they don't want to be in the newspaper anywhere. They also see that the costs of compliance are increasing. There needs to be much more done than before. And it is not as easy as it was before. It's, it's become a bit more complex. And on top of it, your planning opportunities, some of them are effectively killed through the BEPS action points. Hybrid is just an example of it. The, uh, the potential uh, lowering of the threshold for PE, uh, which increases cost. So there's a number of these aspects that come into play, which means that your planning value is, is dropping versus your compliance costs are going up. And thirdly, your risk is increasing. So typically, the tax director will probably say, I need more people. And the CFO will say, well, I'm going to take some people away from you because you're no longer my profit center that I thought you were. You're a compliance and risk center, so get efficiencies up, which means maybe automation. So the world also for the tax director has changed, in, in our view, and, and we're already seeing where typically you have very good planning people, they're dropping off, and you see more compliance people remaining, uh, which is quite a, a sign, I think, of times to come. If we go to the next slide, Maria, what does that mean? It means that there is a, a, a new world uh, entering where we see compliance, risk, and I've added here also opportunity cycle because planning does not necessarily have to be dead, but it has, be, has become much more complex uh, and it also requires much more involvement uh, of tax in the business. So tax has to get much more into the business and, and convince the business to do certain things if that might still make sense from a tax planning perspective. Um, what do we try to say here? It's basically what I referred to already earlier. On the left hand side you see the tax compliance part which you, you know it can be corporate income tax returns, CBC, TP doc. Uh, plus a lot of data that comes that you need to analyze for compliance purposes. The second part is then, you know, your provisioning because once you have your TP documentation in order, your benchmarks, your allocations of the EBIT levels over, you know, the units, you need to make sure that you understand what actually happened first is what is within the range, so to speak, and that gives you your opportunity of assessing your levels of risk and allows you to do provisioning in your books. It also then determines your effective tax rate position. Um, and I think with you know, the value chain analysis that you're doing, you have an opportunity now to pick up and say, okay, with the value chain analysis, I've done now an allocation of basically my EBIT over the different functions, which then also brings certain countries into that uh, category. Now, what is my appetite for risk? Is my organization willing to take certain risk? If I'm within the range, if I'm at the lower end of the range, am I at the upper end of the range, do I have room to maneuver, yes or no? Uh, 
And this is where uh, you might have a way to say, okay, to your CFO, well, there is an opportunity. Are we able to talk? What might be today more, uh, more likely is that we may have mismatches between the operating model and what we always believed was our tax operating model and is what we always reflected in our t into our corporate income tax returns. And we can see a mismatch and that creates a risk that requires mitigation probably or again, depending on your risk appetite, you might want to keep it and sit it out and see what the audit brings you. But maybe it means that you have to look at your documentation again and trying to find more and better arguments than you had before. Again, so this is the risk management side, which I have to believe is a, is a direct consequences of your compliance, where you need to get much more data, much more factual information about activities, significant people functions is one of those things that comes up again and again. So, you know, this is the cycle we see. Then the third component, to finish it basically off, um, but it's not the end of the game, it is potentially even the start of the game. We see here tax governance again as a second point. Uh, we alluded to it earlier. You need to get organized as a tax department. You need to make sure that you reset roles, responsibilities within your team in combination with the business and more so with the business as I mentioned before. Sign off is an element of that. Who signs off on what? Do you have the right to sign off or they don't need your signature and they can do what they want? If that's the case, the question is whether you're in control. So these are elements that we all would arguably say need to be revisited, reset and probably realigned in, in terms of what is now the world of, um, of, of BEPS with its compliance requirements. Last but not least, storage, um, because at the end of the day, you need to have information to share with people that are asking you questions like tax inspectors. So you need to somehow find a way to uh, document everything in a, in a good way, but also have the backup for it that you need to store. But that's nothing new. Uh, it's just a, a reflection of what needs to happen. What is it that we at TPA Global are now uh, trying to bring uh, to you, to our clients, is a way to manage all this and to get aligned around all these aspects that we have in this box on the left hand side, uh, box A, the, the corporate income tax uh, return, say if that's the piece that we, we file, CBC and TP documentation. If we go into the next um, slide, just very briefly, we are looking at a global tax compliance solution, which is an, an automated environment where, you know, we as, as, as the provider of service would collaborate with you as the client and where you have access to dashboards, more than one dashboard. This is just a picture of how a dashboard might look, but it would be built up in such a way that all the data points that are relevant from a corporate income tax return perspective, from an effective tax rate management perspective, from a tax accounting perspective, in other words, uh, all the way down to uh, your, your CBC and your transfer pricing documentation. It will be captured in such a way that you can run analysis on it, that you have different views on how it is done, whether your status of filing is in order, whether the content elements are in order. Um, we would recommend that at the central level in the tax department you start managing a, a much more uh, centralized control over all these aspects of compliance. If we go into the next slide, Maria, um, this is just to depict a little bit where you have, you know, once you have all your financial relevant information the quantitative data coming out of ETR, financial data, corporate income tax, key data and benchmarks and CBC, you might also want to bring in uh, more uh, qualitative data points. You can run different sorts of analyses. I can mention one which is the outlier analysis, more or less what we just uh, said with FTEs versus EBIT percentages. Um, they all give a certain indication of risk they all will give a certain indication of what are your opportunities. 
and then with the appetite of risk of your organization, which you need to agree with your boss, with your, your CEO maybe as well, you can come to a conclusion whether you go yes on planning again, will you then be able to change the mind of the business that they may have to move certain people to other locations or would it actually force you to walk away from what you had as a tax strategy operating model and realign that one more to the actual facts of what the business is doing. Uh, each and every one of those questions will have to be answered in terms of a business case and having the data available as I mentioned, you stored it, you have it, will make your life uh, much more easier in running these analysis and coming up with, you know, what is the impact on my effective tax rate, what is the impact on my cash position, what's the impact on my uh, risk uh, that I reserve in my books, etc. I can do forecasting, etc. And that is how you can start getting back into control in a post-BEPS world. And that's what we try to uh, share with you here. If you look at the element specific of effective tax rate, which if we go to the next slide, Maria, is really the the back end of everything that is being done by the tax department and more or less is what your your stakeholders will see, whether it's your board, whether it's your CFO or whether it's really the market in that sense if you're a quoted company, it all comes back to what is your effective tax rate. And we're not looking here at a slide, a waterfall chart that is reflecting a rate reconciliation as you would typically find it in any annual uh, uh, annual uh, account of a company. No, this is driven by activity where tax has a hand on it. Uh, if you look on the left hand side, that's basically a weighted average tax rate absent of any tax planning elements or any tax relevant uh, elements like, you know, we see here on the left hand side, we see something like cost that are non-deductible all those are eliminated from the actual ETR calculation, which is the end game of any uh, tax accounting activity when you file your annual accounts. And then you start looking at, okay, adding back each and every element that you eliminated and say, okay, is this a recurring one? Yes, no. Is it a one-off? Yes, no. Uh, but maybe even more importantly, is tax department capable of steering that one? Has it got a, can, can tax actually influence it? If you look at non-deductible costs, nobody can influence. That's by law, so that it's not something you can do. So they stay on the side of, on the left-hand side, whether they're recurring or one-offs. So if you have goodwill impairments, that's not something you as a tax director can decide on. That is a business issue. So any impact of that, if you don't have a tax benefit coming from that, you know, that's not yours. But anything on the right-hand side, which I refer to as strategic, that's where you can make an impact. So these are tax strategies maybe needed to be there, so they're not, in, you know, the bad word of tax planning. But, you know, you will charge a brand royalty because also legally that it's sometimes necessary or technology licenses. And they will be very clearly described. And again, here you would say the delta between the 43 and the 29 here in this example, that is basically the benefit that tax department seems to be bringing to the group. So still, you should be able to make at least the claim that you're contributing uh, and that you might not necessarily be a cost center. But that's the area where you need to look at whether that still stands up in BEPS land, whether that's still acceptable, and if it is, does it get covered enough by the significant P for functions in the right locations? Does that fit? Yes, no. And if it does, you sort of go back to the drawing board and say, well, okay, this is still the picture for me. So there is still opportunity, and these are the elements that will help you as a tool to manage your, your tax position in that sense. With that, I want to give it to Maria for the next section. Maria? Thank you, Raymond. So we are moving now to the third section uh, of successful tax and TT function, which is actually addressing BAPS and technical questions.
So, but first of all, it's necessary to, dis to understand which of the BAP sections are applicable to your company, which of the BAP challenges are really challenges for your company, because maybe everything is okay. So, how we suggest it could be done is through BAP uh, review. Uh, in particular, in TPA, we developed a tool uh, suggesting how to apply BAPs on your company, because BAPs is effectively 2,000 pages of text which is nobody has time to read. And we developed uh, a tool uh, how to uh, check if your company is BAPS proof. Uh, this tool helps to identify at high level uh, the readiness of the company to comply with BAPS rules. Uh, the assessment of the tool captures insights across the organization using the interviews and uh, in analytics uh, uh, <clears throat> in order to uh, understand uh, BAP's risk for your company. Based on this broader understanding of risks, certain improvement initiatives and risk management tactics may be developed. Uh, this tool uh, already was applied on several companies, and what we typically see is that uh, BAP's challenges for companies uh, are permanent establishment, uh, hybrid, primary purpose tests, intangibles, uh, and also C by C outliers. And uh, this table presents the example we discussed before, that C by C easily suggests uh, how the EBIT is allocated in the company against the FTEs. And uh, as you can see, there is a very huge mismatch between the EBIT allocated to manufacturing uh, and EBIT allocated to company in Luxembourg, uh, which probably is doing R&D, however, the number of FTEs is really low, so uh, the allocation is really questionable. Uh, other areas of exposure by BAPS can be thought uh, as digital economy, uh, also uh, leverage of uh, on treaty abuse, and uh, uh, lack of tax uh, management framework. Uh, this is how the assessment of this BAPS review tool looks like. Uh, and as you may see, there are uh, lots of issues that should be addressed now. And uh, this particular picture provides uh, the uh, certain key insights. So for example, uh, we understood that company is vulnerable uh, to the risk on, uh, because of its high dependence on digital products and uh, royalties from IP. Uh, in addition, the company applied tax techniques such as uh, double Irish Dutch sandwich, uh, which also are not uh, now possible under that. Uh, last but not least, company uh, had no so TP software solution in place in order to uh, manage TP compliance uh, efficiently and successfully. Uh, and uh, I should mention that this tool uh, is available at TPA and uh, it can be applied in a really short time period. Uh, so from uh, start to finish in two weeks and the interviews take one day and the analytics take two days. And then we can provide you with a full report suggesting which risks should be addressed. So, Maria, hold on. Can I, yes. Maria? Can you maybe just one thing go back to the slide which is uh, on page 16? Just one of, okay. If you look at this slide, uh, if you remember what I was talking about earlier in terms of how how is in today's world of your organization the profit allocated? You you know we have obviously made here a nice dummy example, um, but it is not very unrealistic uh, in, in some instances where you see effectively coming through a value chain analytical exercise, you see R&D manufacturing marketing and distribution roles and you see EBIT percentages spread over where you see also the lowest tax rate at the bottom. Um, this has been some traditional planning if you will, but if the actual people functions, activities are not there, this is, this is in a very simple way reflecting what we can sometimes see with companies. This is obviously an area of potential risk and where you may want to go for mitigation. Again, this is risk management along the lines we, we, we just debated and, and uh, highlighted. Uh, through the BEPS review, test 
this is a very quick, as Maria said, it's a very quick assessment. It's not an in-depth assessment, but it helps you to get some direction. And you might get, you know, the areas of risk in combination maybe with information that you already readily have available, which you can draw in a similar way that we have it here uh, from your financial data that you have available already today, because effectively it sits in your ETR calculations. You could already, in combination with the very quick BAPS review, come to conclusions whether you have risks, uh, and then you can take the next step. So. The point I'm trying to make is that this type of review is uh, relatively straightforward to do and doesn't take too much time if you do it right. And at the same time, it can already, in combination with information you have readily available, already give you some indications where you might want to start having conversations with your business. So, you know, that's where I just wanted to add uh, some couple of points. Maria, up to you. And then. Yeah. Um. Thank you, that was really valuable. So I just now would like to summarize what we discussed. So as I mentioned before, uh, the first step for you to be in control is to organize your governance of tax and TP function. Whether you do it through uh, allocation of responsible, accountable, consulted people, or uh, of any other governance model, this is not really important. The most important point is that you know how it is organized, you know how, who and how reports to you, and that you can uh, easily uh, gain any information you need. Second is to manage uh, compliance risk and opportunities. This can be done uh, a lot through automated solutions, such as uh, programs for writing reports uh, or analytical tools presented by Rhinos. Uh, third is you need to address your BAPS challenges. So you need to first understand them, and then uh, you need to think of a plan how to address risks, if there are any, and how to improve uh, some things uh, if they are not that risky uh, for now. With this uh, three points, you can claim that you're in control, but of course I think there will be more challenges to come uh, by OECD, but also by local countries, because based on OECD suggestions, a uh, lot of countries, such as China, Australia, uh, are presenting much more uh, comprehensive and much more uh, in-depth uh, requirements for multinationals. No, I think this, is, uh, this summarizes it very well. Um, I think what we're trying to say is that, uh, again, revisit your organizational setup, uh, revisit your role's responsibility as a tax function. You probably need more involvement on the business side and, and embed them into your processes, if you will. The, the, the racing model can be extremely helpful there. It also gives a clear cutoff between who is responsible for what and what has to be done. Um, that in itself leads you to, you know, the managing then subsequently the whole compliance process with all its aspects and all the information that comes from that can help you to identify risk opportunities. You mentioned it already and embedded in that is obviously the whole uh, ad addressing uh, some of the more BAPS technical aspects of how your organization is structured um, to get back into control and the, the whole thing is actually driven by uh, the assumption that you know, if you go back to our first slides that Maria shared, which is basically the tax inspector will tomorrow get much better information and he will have it in one hand. So he has the upper hand over you if that's not information that is controlled by you. So that world is a little bit put upside down uh, compared to, you know, the, 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 the days before BEPS. So with that, uh, conclusion, I would like to say if people have questions, um, we're going to be giving you uh, a couple of minutes to write down in the chat uh, some questions that we can then uh, pick up. Um, so with that, are there any questions that you would like to address? Uh, so thank you for attending our webinar. Uh, if you have uh, any questions, uh, please feel free to call us or to write us an email.